Uh, so go ahead and start playing, Daniel. Me? Yeah. Start I, playing I, the video. Oh, me? Oh, sorry. Aaron I thought it was Daniel doing it. Okay, no, here we go. Uh, I am. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, yeah. Okay. In a land of frying, a rose for me, bear me, 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 trying. Gesucht an I am Jerusalem. This is a land for me, and this land is thine land, this land is mine land, from California to Ellis Island. Von die Größe Osres bis die Breite Jamen. Das ist ein Land von mir und dir. Ich geh ja rüber, die Berg und Terre. Aaron Gering gut, von süße Kerle. Die Ritschkes Mohren, die Fego singen. Das ist ein Land von mir und dir. Se a glóis moia, me dá chilvis mort. Filmen a rainet, steit as metonit. Non a fiena zait, steit tot no gonit. O tis de zait, fadir um dia. Tos mandis dai lan, tos mandis mai lan. Von California, bis Ellis Island.
Amazing. Uh, thank you so much, um, all of you on this call for joining us. I'm Jody Rujoran. I'm the editor in chief of The Forward, and I'm so excited about having this event. Um, Lauren, can you go ahead and stop sharing your screen so that we can? Yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, oh, sorry, let, you want to run sorry the credits. There's You're an important right. thing at the end there. Yeah. Yep, this is part of the story. It I'm sorry. Great. It's yeah, definitely okay. part of it. It's okay. All right, um, there we go. Thanks, <laughs> thanks so much. And so thanks to everybody for joining us. I love seeing in the chat, we have people from all over the world. Actually, we have people from all over the world on this panel as well, who I'll introduce in just a second. Um, I'm so excited to have you all with us and the connections back to the forwards of old and to different aspects of where you learned Yiddish are really interesting to see. Um, just, I wanna, I'm gonna, do a couple of logistical items before we start, then I'll introduce the panel and then we'll get into it. Um, you already are familiar with the chat and by now you're all Zoom experts, I'm sure. We, will we would love to have you um, ask questions of our panelists and you should use the Q&A button, not the chat for that. It's found in the same basic area of your screen, either on the bottom if you're on the computer or on the left, I think, if you're on a phone. But so if you have a question you want me to ask the panelists, go ahead and post in the Q&A. And otherwise, feel free to use the chat to comment and share um, with each other. We will also uh, be providing a video of this conversation, as well as any other links that we share in the chat to articles or other things. Um, we'll send that all to you by email, along with a discounted subscription to the forward. And we'd love to have you um, share that with any of your friends. I think this is also being broadcast on Facebook right now live, although I'm not positive about that, but if it's not yet, it will be. Um, so you can also share that link uh, later. Um, as I said, my name's Jody. I'm the editor in chief of The Forward. And we've been doing a series of Yiddish uh, Zoominars that I haven't been involved with that are great. Um, Rachel Schechter and Jordan Kutzik have been hosting and I'm very excited to sort of get into this space for my first time. And I wanna thank Rachel for her help along with Lisa Lepsen um, and Mira Fox who's hosting this seminar for putting this together. Um, we have had something like 59,000 views of this video on YouTube so far. I think Jordan calculated that it has been viewed for a total of almost four months of viewing time. And I think I'm only responsible for, well, maybe a hundred of those views. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to just, as I said, introduce our panelists. First up, we have Daniel Kahn, who is the main producer of this video song translation. Daniel's calling in from Berlin today. He is a Detroit-born and Berlin-based troubadour songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, as you can see, and translator. He mixes Yiddish, English, klezmer, and punk folk. And his groups have included the Painted Bird, Brothers Nazaroff, Semra Ensemble and the Internationale. He's a co-founder of the Earthwork Music Collective and the Shtetl Berlin Festival. Um, he's been featured in Carnegie Hall's From Shtetl to Sage. There's much more to say about his great accomplishments and he has, this is uh, a, one of a number of video productions that he's done in conjunction with The Forward and we're so proud to have him as part of our family and on this call today. One of his collaborators, of course, is Lauren Sklamberg, who's a founding member of the Klezmatics, the Grammy award-winning Klezmatics. He teaches Yiddish song everywhere from Sao Paulo to St. Petersburg. I don't know if, that, is that Florida or, or Russia? Russia. Russia, much, much more impressive. And one of his <laughs> recent never, works is- I've never taught in Florida, actually. <laughs> well, see, you have to work on that. <laughs> um, his recent work includes 150 Someday, Voices, which is a collaboration with choirs in the UK, as well as the US. And he's been since, for about 20 years, he's been the sound archivist of the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research, which is one of our great friends and partners. And he curates there the Ruth Rubin Legacy website, which has um, a collection of 3,000 of his Yiddish folk songs. Um, he's also one of the premier American singers in any genre, according to All Things Considered. So that's obviously a, a great plot it. We also have Jordan Kutzik, um, the deputy editor of the Yiddish Forward. He's been at the Yiddish Forward since 2013, and he has been um, the partner with Daniel on, on making these videos, getting them published. And he also writes for the Forward. So he writes a weekly music video roundup featuring new and classic Yiddish songs, including many translations into Yiddish from the Hasidic world, from the international klezmer scene, et cetera. 
Then we have Michael Wex. He's the author of three books on Yiddish, including uh, Born to Kvetch, the best-selling book. He has taught the language at several universities and his most recent book, it's great at titles, Rhapsody in Schmaltz, uh, did for Yiddish food what Born to Kvetch did for Yiddish speech. Uh, and he had a, a, a cabaret, an all Yiddish cabaret called Baim Cabaret Yitesh, I probably mispronounced that, that premiered at the 2019 edition of the Yiddish Summer Weimar. Um, and it included Weimar. Daniel Kahn. Oh. And included Daniel Kahn, fantastic. It's a small little internecine world here, right? And then we have Ruckel Kafferson, um, who's both a journalist and a playwright based in New York City. Um, she writes a column called Ruckel's Golden City that began appearing in Tablet back in 2017. It is about new Yiddish culture in all of its iterations. And she's also written opinion pieces and cultural criticism in newspapers all over the world. Um, Rachel was um, a fellow at the 14th Street Y last year. And she did a play there, wrote a play called Stumer Shabbos, Silent Sabbath. And that was recently featured at Vancouver's Chutzpah Festival. Um, which who, I mean, I want to go to the Chutzpah Festival. <laughs> and during the pandemic, as there's been such an increased demand for remote education, Rachel has been a guest speaker on modern Yiddish culture in a number of virtual classrooms. She's working on her first English to Yiddish song translation. We will hear more about that soon. Um, sorry for so much wind up, but you guys all have so many interesting points in your bios. So let's get into it. Daniel, please tell us how this project came to be. Um, and I know Jordan will jump in and probably others, but just start from the beginning. Why did you translate this song? Tell us the whole story of how this happened. Well, it had a circuitous uh, route to get to me, um, it, it, which actually, uh, it came to Lauren first, I believe. There was uh, a question posed to the YIVO archive. Am I, correct me if I'm wrong, Lauren. At YIVO, there was a question posed by one of our colleagues. If there was a Yiddish version of This Land is Your Land, like one that had been written a while ago. And I think, Lauren, you took it to our friend Linda Gritz. And Linda Gritz is, is an amazing, uh, she's a songwriter and a translator and an organizer and a choir conductor and uh uh, like a one woman revolution. She lives in Boston. She's very active in the, the Boston workers circle and uh, runs a choir there, the Besser uh, Welt Chor. And um, she's just um, an amazing like font of creativity and enthusiasm. And she's particularly, she's very engaged in social justice movements and uh, making Yiddish a vibrant part of contemporary conversations about social justice. So uh, Linda, I've known for years I, in many different workshops and festivals. Um, and so Lauren put the question to, to Linda um, and she then I believe spoke with Zalman Molotek and then she worked out, she did a, a, a draft of a translation. We weren't the first ones to to make a Yiddish version of this song. Uh, there There is a Yiddish version, a really wonderful version by the great Eleanor Risa, who, who is, you, you may know, she's an incredible singer and theater artist, playwright. Um, and she has a wonderful, really adaptation of This Land is Your Land, which she sings. Do you remember, do you remember what year that was that she made that? Um, or about? May, I, I think she said, it was already in the Trump era. Oh, okay. Yeah, but you, you should ask. 2016, 2017 or so. Yeah, it was. At least when the video went on YouTube. Yeah, and, and hers her version is very much a response to uh, Trump's xenophobia, his uh, fascistic attitude uh, and, and racism and, and, and uh, anti-immigrant uh, politics. And so her version, it's wonderful. And I, I've actually performed it as well, along with Lauren and some others. And uh, but it's it's very far from the original. It's really her own original adaptation of it. And so I think the question was really about a, a more um, faithful just uh, translation or 
adaptation, but that was closer to the original uh, by Woody Guthrie. And so Linda took it upon herself and she created one version and then she brought it to Natalia Mlotek and then she brought it to a workshop that I was uh, teaching along with Josh Waletsky at this year's online Yiddish New York. Um, and it was called the Lieder Schmiederei, where we were working on new songs and oh, excuse me, new songs and translations and and uh, um, you know built new settings of poems and things like that. And she brought that to the group. And, and that's like how long ago that you went that that workshop was? Uh, oh, that was in uh, that was in December. Oh, okay. At the end of last year, and she made some edits and then brought it back a couple days later. And then I talked to her about meeting outside of the class to really dig into it and kind of get into the weeds with it. Um, because it, it piqued my interest immediately. I'm a songwriter who, like many, uh, Woody Guthrie is a foundational figure for me as, as, as a songwriter. And, um, and this song in particular means a lot to me. And translating songs into and out of Yiddish is something that I, I do so uh I, but it's me, something that ask, i do let me just bring lauren and Rachel in yeah. for a second i i will find out more about when you came into the project a little later but i want to hear about whether why it also spoke to you how it also spoke to you you know why why and how this project piqued your interest uh lauren well, it sounds like you were involved earlier so maybe jump in now well the thing is that i i the the person who um who asked me about a translation was Benjamin Schechter from uh, the People's Philharmonic Chorus. Um, and, you know, uh, they have a history of performing um, uh, politically progressive material. And, you know, of course, my work with, you know, with the Klezmatics and with Woody Guthrie's lyrics, I, and just growing up, it's, it's just, first of all, uh, the, the connection to Woody Guthrie, you know, is, you know, for me is, is really important. Um, but also that um, my main mode of, you know, the even though the, the Guthrie things that we did were all in English, really my mode of, um, of communication with musically and spiritually is with Yiddish. So, um, you know, it's like, I, 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 you know, certainly feel like I would rather be saying things in Yiddish than in English because um, I feel like, you know, Yiddish is something that I want to protect and that I want to um, preserve and, and I want people to be singing it. And in a lot of cases, people wouldn't be singing a lot of, a lot of songs if they weren't actually in Yiddish because there wouldn't be a reason and sort of, you know, because, uh, you know, in the place where sort of Yiddish and like, like sort of like like human rights issues intersect or the is the place that's where my home is so and a lot of people other people as well so i think that it's really important to you know to keep up that tradition yeah and, and, so and of course what happens next daniel so you decide to take it on and then how do you put this whole thing together well uh, i mean it it kind of uh, was like a, the snowball rolling down the hill. And, and so Linda and I worked on it um, for quite a while, back and forth. Um, and then I brought in our good friend, Michael Alpert, um, who is, it, and in, uh, he, he, he needs no introduction, but he, uh, he's an amazing singer, researcher, teacher, uh, also klezmer, multi-instrumentalist, uh, and also an, an, a, a very gifted songwriter. Um, he writes some of the most amazing contemporary Yiddish songs um, and good English ones. And he's, he's just an amazing guy. He's a, he's a mentor and a, uh, a friend. And so I brought it to him to, because he and I also have, you know, sung a lot of Woody Guthrie songs together. And uh, he started working on it. And then we brought in Joshua Letsky. Uh, again, who had already been working on it in, in the class. And, and it, 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 was, it was a little like Tom Sawyer's fence. You know, I got everybody to, to come in and, and work on it together. So uh, it ended up being uh, having a lot of uh, love and care. And each, each word was very, very carefully picked. Um, and then eventually we had a final version of the, the song. And I thought, um, 
well, it would be great to make a video for this. And Lauren had the suggestion that we make a video with many different singers. And I, I thought that was, that was beautiful, particularly with this song. So we brought in uh, our friends here in Berlin, uh, Sveta Kundish and Patrick Farrell. Uh, we brought in uh, our friend Sarah Gordon in Brooklyn. Uh, and we had Michael sing and Lauren, and uh, Lauren played piano. And then uh, in the end, um, Linda Gritz, the original translator, joined us for the final verse uh, and chorus. And then I, I, I brought in my... Uh, beautiful wife, Yeva, and our beautiful son, Leon, and they were at the very end. So, yes, that, and then we, yeah, and then I put the video together and we put it out. Great. Um, and this is not the first time that you partnered with The Forward. Jordan, tell us a little bit about our, our The Forward's relationship, The Forward's relationship with Daniel and other stuff that we've done together. So we... Um, so I've known Daniel since before I started at the, the Fulvid. So, um, of course, um, in normal non COVID times, we have a studio and want, uh, always wanted him to come in and do something. And I think it was in the spring of 2015, perhaps it may have been the spring of 2016, actually, 16, um, 16 yeah, oh. he perform he performed. For um, for Hallelujah, you performed it at a launch party for a publication called In Geveb, which is a Yiddish scholarly journal, uh, scholarly journal of Yiddish studies. Um, and I heard it and I said, we got to grab this. And it took it a while summer. to, summer. Yeah. yeah, it was the summer, right? It was the summer and it took a while to arrange. Um, Daniel came in, we recorded it. And by freak chance, the day it was released, which was the day after um, the 2016 election, um, was the day it was announced that Leonard Cohen had passed away. He had actually passed before. away. Yeah, it was like six yeah. hours before or something. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it was this bizarre moment because my reaction was horror because I thought, oh, people are going to be angry. They're going to think we're taking advantage of the situation. And it was just the opposite. Everyone thought it was a tribute and said, how'd you get this together so quickly? And it was a complete, um, it was a complete fluke, but it was very um, meaningful for people. And we weren't the only ones that made that connection. Um, Kate McKinnon sang um, Hallelujah as Hillary Clinton on Saturday Night Live that week. So there was, the, there was this kind of interesting amalgam of Leonard Cohen and the election and it was a very interesting and fraught and special moment and um, in my mind uh, Daniel's version of Hallelujah was the soundtrack to that. So Daniel mentioned when he was just talking about um, two things that you know caught my attention he was taught you were talking about how every word like the choice of which every word was so careful and um, I was really struck when I first saw the video and heard the song at, yeah, the, the way things were or weren't changed, how much was changed or not. And it, when you just referred to Eleanor's original version and said that was a much different version, that was more like she was inspired by the song. So I'm gonna actually ask everyone and I'll have Daniel go last, um, but I'd love everyone to say which lyric um, kind of is the most interesting to them in terms of what was changed. I guess, because for me, it's a representation of how the Guthrie song and Yiddish culture intersect is this question of what was tweaked and not tweaked and how. And um, I think I had, when I'd heard about the fact that you were doing this, I did not know it would, the, the lyrics would, not that they changed a lot, they're, they're all very subtle changes, but I thought, I thought it would be much more direct of a translation. Um, which is, shows how little I know about translation, I'm sure. But anyway, um, Rachel, do you want to start? Is there a particular line that, that, that you feel is most powerful or interesting in terms of the, you know, the creative license that the translation is? It's funny. Um, maybe this is just a tiny thing, but when I, I was watching Daniel perform and, like, and I'm talking to him right now and I heard him sing, you know, to the Great Lakes, the... Um, did you say, is it Größe Ozere? Yeah, the Größe Ozeres. Right. And, you know, Daniel is from uh, Michigan, 
And, uh, you know, you, you know, you think he's a very sophisticated Berlin resident now, um, but of <laughs> course being from the Detroit area is a really important part of his identity. And I really thought of that when I heard him sing that, like, oh yeah, you know, the Great Lakes and I as a very parochial New Yorker have never been to the Great Lakes nor seen them. I hear they're great. Um, but I like I love that you point that they out. Are great. <laughs> For me, like, you know, the Ellis Island thing is sort of so like, oh, of course we would change that. But I I also I was like, oh yeah, like I want it made me think about who was coming to the Great Lakes and the Midwest and and all of that. So I agree. Michael, what what lyric uh hit you as an uh, interesting choice? I have to say none of them because I'm not an American. Uh I don't know the song in <laughs> that version, the version that I know was written by somebody who I see is here, Jerry Gray from The Travelers. Uh, they did the, wasn't, I don't think it was really authorized, but they did the Canadian version. Uh, and that's the one that I know. And Rochel, has the great to, I know you've been to Toronto, Rochel. Don't yeah, you know where the Great Lakes are? Uh, <laughs> okay. Name the five Great Lakes. Come on. <laughs> Come on, I bet you can't do it, can you? Lake, Lake, Lake Toronto, yeah. uh, Lake Mississauga. Yeah, Lake Buffalo. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. So I, I mean, I really, I, you know, I've heard the Woody Guthrie version, but I don't know it off the top of my head. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll take that. Jordan, what about you? Um, for me, the line with the new, uh, seeking a new, out of the desert, seeking a new uh, Jerusalem, there's this beautiful line in the original uh, about diamond deserts. And when I first heard the, uh, that this, the translation would be coming, that was my first thought. And I heard that line, um, leaving the desert for a new Jerusalem. I said, you know, it was perfect. It has this universal kind of Exodus uh, message, but a very specific Jewish uh, resonance and it even rhymes. It, I was blown away by that line. I suppose that's one of the interesting things about doing this too, is that for, for the non-Canadians, um, we're so familiar with the chorus of this story, but of this song, but we actually, most people don't know all the lyrics at all. Like I don't, I did not remember the Desert Diamond um, line. So it's kind of interesting that even, even what you are changing or not, people may not realize. Uh, Lauren, you're next. What's your favorite line? My, well, I mean, I, I just, I just, I like, I mean, I like the verse that I, that I sing in, in the video, which is the one about the sign, because I think that that's sort of, sort of Woody in a, in a, in a nutshell. I, I like, I like that verse a lot. Um, and also the last verse, because it really sort of, because we all sing it together and it, it, it's, I think it's really powerful. I, I, I you know, I think I love that. And, uh, Remind it's us the words again. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the last verse is, uh, es ist keine, no, es kann schon keiner uns nicht verstehen, die freie Wegen uns nicht verwehren, nicht auch kein Samen, wenn nur zusammen. Das ist ein Land von mir und dir, which roughly translated means um, no one can stop us or prevent us. No, no one can, uh, can, deny us the the roads of freedom uh there are no borders or boundaries as long as we are united yeah this is a land and, for me and, and you and i would say of that verse the penultimate line in the beautiful zaman uh salmon suzaman i mean that's fantastic um, that's that line is pure josh Waletsky. yeah it's really really beautiful um you know so so that's that those are my favorite favorite parts. Daniel, what's your favorite line? My favorite line. Oh, I, I was listening to everybody else. I didn't think of one. Or maybe what was the hardest one to name? I don't know. You don't have to answer if you don't want. We can move on. The, I mean, honestly, <laughs> well, no. I mean, yeah, we we really did like wrestle with every single line in the song. Um, Ultimately, this this line that keeps getting repeated, "This is a land for me and dear," is is something that we went back and forth in a million different variants, and because it, it's not the most idiomatic way of saying something in Yiddish, but it's rather close to the English, it's recognizably close to the English even for non-Yiddish speakers, the, and. That is also the most problematic line of the original song in many ways. You know, 
Um, but as you said, a lot of people don't know the full version of this song. This song was written in 1940 uh, in a motel room um, after Woody Guthrie hitchhiked across the country from California to New York. And the entire way, all he could hear on the radio was Kate Smith singing Irving Berlin's God Bless America, which had just come out uh, uh, like a month earlier. And he couldn't stand it. He thought it was just smug, jingoistic, chauvinistic, you know, nationalistic tripe. He couldn't, he thought it was kitsch. And he wrote an angry response to the song, which was called God Blessed America for Me, saying that God, there's nothing special about this government. It's about the land and the people, that it's a beautiful, beautiful continent, beautiful nature, but it should belong, or it's not about belonging to the people. It's that it's, we belong to it. It is, it is ours. We are the people. And uh, so that's where his poem came from. He didn't sing it for many years after that. He changed it a little bit here and there, but it had very radical verses in it. Um, speaking about, there was a big sign there that said private property. It tried to stop me. It, but on the other side, it didn't say nothing. That side is for me and for you and me. And he talks about the poor in the cities waiting in the relief lines. This was in the, during the middle of the depression. Um, and he says, nobody living can ever stop me as I go walking my freedom highway. Um, and those verses were never sung. They, they were bolderized out. They were, they were not taught in schools. Everybody thought it was just, just another good old patriotic song. And I think Woody Guthrie really regretted that people didn't learn that song in its entirety. And I know Arlo throughout his life has put in a lot of effort to, to teach the full version, as did Pete Seeger. And um, so it was important for, for me and for Linda and for all of us to really find a way of expressing the, the, the breadth of the song and, and its depth and, and its full length, uh, but to do it in a way that brought out um, a particularly Jewish perspective or, or a Yiddish perspective. Which, I'm going to pause you there for just a second, yeah. Daniel, first for just a programming note, which is a lot of you are putting comments in the chat, but just to panelists. If you're making a comment that you want everyone to see, which I think these are, please do it to all panelists and attendees. And again, if you have a question that you want me to ask the panelists, which I'll get to in just a few minutes, put those in Q&A, but don't just chat to us because your comments are great for everyone to see. I was gonna also try to, you know, I'm gonna ask what I think is like a pretty dumb question about translation, but you know, I am gonna assume that not everybody on the Call is a professional uh, who works in translation or interpretation, but I just, I'm really interested in all of you talking, picking up on some of what Daniel was saying and sharing a little bit about your philosophy on kind of what this whole thing is about and how much it's about, you know, changing the language, changing from one language to another versus one experience to another, how much it's about rhyme versus, um, versus honoring the original spirit or tweaking the original spirit. I mean, there's so many, um, interesting creative and intellectual challenges in this in this world and i'd love you to share some of your own of your philosophies on how how to how to balance those well i'd like to say something i'm not a translator i'm a critic so you know the parasite who feeds off the creativity of the translator um but one of the things that i think is so interesting and important about especially about a translation like this is the way it has the potential to uh, really see old texts with fresh eyes, right? So This Land is Your Land is very much, as we were just saying, a song that has become so familiar to us as to seem like a folk song, like not a composed song, which was even not composed so long ago. It was composed in 1940, as Daniel mentioned, in a hotel or a motel at 43rd Street and 6th Avenue, right? Like you can't get more urban, frankly, than that. And, um, you know, not only was it composed by a person we know of in this urban setting, but that it was composed within a very specific matrix of politics that Woody was, you know, aligned with certain kind of communist politics and, you know, it, the words evolved also in concert with changes in his politics and the war and whatever. Um, and I think that a translation like this is so great because it it brings to light the fact that these are 
composed song, that this is a composed song and it has its own set of politics. It is a historical artifact. And it makes us ask these questions and ask, oh, what are the words? Where are all the words? And, and all those kind of things. It just breaks it wide open. And I think that's so important. Michael, you're gonna jump in? Uh, I could. Uh, for me, it's the idea, you know, generally, and this is something, it's a, uh, something people I, I think don't talk about often enough. Generally, you take, if you're gonna do a translation of something, you're gonna translate it from a language th that nobody in the translated sector or most people in the translated sector don't speak. Right, so it would make sense to take a Yiddish song and translate it into English and come up with a big hit. What we're doing with stuff like this, and I do similar things too, is we're taking a song that everybody knows and rendering it completely incomprehensible <laughs> to most people. Now, there's the political point of view on this that I don't even <laughs> want to get into, uh, which is let's protest, but I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> Or, you know, hey, hey, LBJ, except LBJ doesn't know you're saying LBJ. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the real question is, yeah, what, what can you bring to it? What can putting it into Yiddish bring to it that you don't already have? I think everybody on this panel, no matter what their relationship with Yiddish is still would be considered by any professional linguist to be a native speaker of English. So what am I going to get out of this? Dan is not a native speaker of English, but uh, no, he's from Detroit. It's, uh, <laughs> not even uh, as far as we can tell. Uh, but you know what? What? Why do you need it? And if you can't answer that question off the top, if it's not bringing something, you know, this is of course I think part of the reason why so much uh, English into Yiddish ends up being satirical because that's an easy and I must say fun way to put something in there that might not have been in there to begin with, but should have been in there. Uh, but when you're dealing with more serious stuff, you know, there's also the matter of when you're dealing with a song that everybody knows, like if you're translating Blame It On My Youth by Oscar Levant, nobody knows the lyrics to that. You can mess around with it. When you're translating something like this, or you know, uh, you know, a Bob Dylan song, whatever, everybody knows where the beats come. Everybody knows what needs to rhyme. You don't have the kind of absolute freedom. You know, you mentioned Jody. What about rhyme and stuff? And I always, if I'm doing something that's supposed to be singable try to stick to the rhyme and meter of the original. I mean, you have to stick to the meter because you've got, you've got the tune, but I, I think it's very important. But After I think what you're saying, Michael, is so interesting about, um, because it raises this question of who it's actually for, and which was something I really thought a lot about when I first watched it, because in general, I feel like we make, like most of the Yiddish content that we make is for the, at growing people who are speak Yiddish and are into Yiddish, Yiddish stuff. And I felt that this was, and maybe I'm wrong about that, but I actually, I guess I felt that this, I'm sure that, that people who are really into Yiddish culture and performance and the Yiddish language loved this, but I, and many people in my world who, you know, saw my posting on Facebook and who speak no Yiddish loved it too. I found I, it was very carefully done to be accessible to an English speaker, right? To someone who speaks no, literally no Yiddish with the um, captioning and stuff. And I, that seemed very purposeful to me. And for me, the Yiddish functioned entirely as a cultural feeling and as a connection to a particular immigrant history and not, you know, it doesn't function as a language for me. I don't understand it, you know? So I was fascinated with both the captioning in English and Yiddish because it felt like a, I don't know. I felt like I was just in this interesting learning process, and but it was all emotional. Um, and I don't know, Daniel, how much you, how you think about that, about who it's for. And I love Michael's question: Why are we doing this? You know? Well, that's that's of course the most important question. I mean, and and or what is rather like what would doing this mean? You know, uh, to to either a, a Yiddish speaking uh, audience or a non-Yiddish speaking audience. 
Um, I, I think that we all think about these things a lot, and it's not only uh, in terms of translation. I mean, we all, uh, I, I, well, all, all four of us who are here and all of the artists who were involved in making this video, we all work we're, we're Yiddish kultur arbiter. You know, we we work in Yiddish largely for audiences that don't speak Yiddish. I'm not a native speaker. Several of the artists who were involved in there were not native speakers, but we've we are in a, a lifelong process of learning the language and and its and its context and cultures and and idioms. Um, I I think you know. I do a lot of translating out of Yiddish into English, but I also do a lot of performing of Yiddish with uh, super titles or, or, you know, with translations. And, and I think that um, crossing those borders uh, is, it can be a radical act and it can be a really inspiring act. And I, I, uh, I think that Yiddish has a lot of stories to tell. And I think it has a lot of, a, a lot to say to the world. Um, uh, culturally, you know, in terms of its literature, in terms of uh, theater and poetry and the songs, but the language itself has, and, and, and I think that Michael is, you know, a, a great example, you know, his books uh, like Born to Kvetch, they, they, they show us explicitly the, the, the richness of Yiddish language, um, its versatility, its its com complexity, its humor, and its its deep, <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's dark and it's light and it's uh, and that all comes in when you if you can translate a song into a Yiddish that works as a song, and this is this question of rhyming and stuff that that's true of any translated song. It's a different, it's a completely different practice than translating for the page. It's different from prose translation. It's even different from literary poetic translation. You are translating something so that it can function on its own in the target language as a song. If it sounds like a translation, then you've failed. It has to be a good song. And that's true when I, in whatever direction you're translating. Yeah, and one, one of the pro, oh, sorry, Rachel. Oh. Well, I, I wanted to bring up, you know, another uh, work that we, we're all familiar with, something that started in English and was translated into Yiddish, and which really also kind of speaks to this question of why, you know, why do this? And I think that that why can have a lot of answers and not everybody, because everybody has their own perspective, there are going to be a lot of answers that may surprise us. So for example, you know, recently there was this huge phenomenon here in New York, which was Yiddish Fiddler, right? Daniel was in that production. Um, and many of us, you know, know it and are familiar with it. And, you know, among Yiddishists for many years, people have listened to the original, the Israeli um, uh, cast uh, recording, which is just incredible. The translation is so good. It's so juicy. Um, and I could talk about that for an hour. But the point is that, you know, then the, there was this incredible sold out, you know, multi extension run here in New York. And most of the people who were attending the show did not, you know, we're not copying the subtleties of the translation and whatever. So, you know, you might say, oh, why are they there? But if you talk to the people who were going, the experience meant a lot to them and touched them in a variety of ways. And I don't think you can necessarily just kind of dismiss it and say, well, it's this post vernacular, or like, well, it's true that like, if you Americans know to learn the roof everywhere in the world at any particular minute, there's a production going on for them. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, literally, everybody knows it, right? So it's inside of you and you can listen to a translation into a language you don't speak and still have the experience of understanding it. And that's very powerful. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about the, the difference for me and the two experiences. And I feel like when I, I, cause I took my parents to Yiddish Fiddler, you know, a couple years ago. And um, what I recall, the powerful experience I recall is us watching the English supertitles and noticing all the places it was different from this production that we knew like by heart. Mm -hmm. And I had a completely different experience of seeing the differences in the English translation in this, of being just like, 
captivated by the choices in a way that I don't know, maybe it was because it was small, more digestible, but um, and also, you know, it just made me cry in a, in a, I felt very emotional about the song. Um, I am realizing that the time is going much faster than I thought, and we have some great questions. So I'm going to turn to the audience questions for a sec. Um, the first two, they're directed really at Daniel, but I think that probably Lauren uh, can talk about them too. Um, they have to do with the specifics about the translation. One is, was thought given to including or adapting the Native American activist Carol is Carolyn Israel's verse. Um, her verse was, this land is your land, but it once was my land. Before we sold you Manhattan Island, you pushed our nations to the reservation. This land was stole by you from me. Um, he know the, the questioner notes that the comments at the end of the video address this, but they're interested in whether you thought about including it. And then Stephen Freed, who says that the, who describes the performance as moving, clear, resonant, honest, and faithful to Woody Guth Guthrie asks if you would talk about the translation of Freedom Highway. So. Oh. <laughs> um, well, uh, for the first, the, the, the first question, it's, it's an excellent question. And I, I know those, that verse, and I love it. Um, I've sung it before in English. Um, we didn't we didn't really talk about including it here because I think the project was really to like make a Yiddish version of the just the original. Um, however, we had long and 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 like really good conversations about the best way to contextualize the song. Um, there was some thought given to just the word choice of this this land was made for you and me this idea of things being made for certain people um it's i mean you can't get away from saying this is my land this is your land but um we didn't want to have any verbs that had to do with belonging with the really especially a song that's so critical of the idea of property we didn't want to fall into the trap of saying like this is this land belongs to me um but we our discussions about these these issues and the 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 problems of the original song resulted in the the note that we have at the end of the video and if you scroll down on the youtube there's also a, an even a little bit longer version of it um because we wanted to address um a the ways in which the song has i believe been misused um especially as it's been abridged and sung in a sort of sanitized version um and we wanted to address the just the way that the song has been perceived and is still perceived um by many different communities uh you know when we're talking about america being a so-called free country um especially as i put it in the first verse which is about you know really about immigration we have to remember, you know, that's not a universal experience of America. Right. Um, the, the, the experience of America is, is not universally of it being a, certainly a free place or a place where immigration is something that was possible or welcomed or voluntary. Um, and from the perspective of indigenous communities who are fighting for um, justice, for, for sovereignty, for, uh, and, 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 you know, black communities who are fighting for reparations. I mean, we wanted to be very clear that we are trying to repurpose this song or bring it back to its progressive original purpose to stand in solidarity with those movements and not to be, not to just- I'm, I'm gonna keep you moving. So tell us about the Freedom uh, Highway. The thing, Freedom Highway. Um, yeah, th that's why we put in the Freie Wegen back. We had actually gotten rid of Freedom Highway in, to have something else in there. And then Linda wanted, oh, I missed the Freedom Highway. And so we put in uh, the, the, the free ways <laughs> will not be, will not, not be denied. talkless questions. Carol Oppenheim, Carolyn Oppenheim wants to know if you had to play royalties to use the song. And Peter Blink Binkley has a question that I also have, which is, where is the map from? Where and when is the map from? The Yiddish map of the US. Oh, um, the, the, ma the map at the very beginning, the color map, um, was from uh, a Yiddish encyclopedia in the Medem Bibliothèque in Paris, which is an amazing Yiddish uh, library. Um, I've had it for years, just as a, a file. And the the map that you see us like sort of flying over is hanging in our kitchen. I bought it on 
eBay at one point. It's a print. It's a reprint of a map that was created by the Office of Industrial Removal, um, which was uh, an immigrant services office in the early 20th century. I know nothing about the history of that office. I, I'm very skeptical about it, but it really had to do with um, getting particularly Jewish immigrants from the, the main sort of influx points of New York or, uh, to move into the interior of America. So they had this. Yiddish and what about map. the copyright or royalties question? About the maps? No, about the using the song. Oh, <laughs> um, well, I, I believe that, you know, it's, it, it's a cover, you know, so um, proceeds from the video go partially to the Woody Guthrie Foundation um, or the, his publisher. Um, and we are talking to them about registering this uh, translation as a, as, a, as a translation. That is great. Um, people are also asking if we have the Yiddish lyrics in um, transliteration in English for pronunciation or and um, asking for other songs with progressive themes translated into Yiddish. So if anybody has a link to that, that they could post in the chat, that would be great. Linda the translation Quinn, and the transliteration are all in the- You're basically in um, the video, right? Video description. If you just scroll down the notes underneath. Okay, great. And, and Mira, can you repost the video in the chat, the link to the video in the chat again for everybody? And then Linda Quigley is asking whether the song has ever been done with verses sung in different languages to evoke the broad span of immigrants. Does anyone know the answer to that? Presumably, at least the chorus, I, I you know, I would guess. I, you know, I, I haven't experienced it, but I would guess that that's happened. I don't know. We have this wonderful question from an anonymous attendee, which is a very Jewish question. So it starts with, is this a question? And then uh, I think it's not a question, but I'm going to read it to you and then ask you all to comment on it. And I think this really, it's, uh, it's so in your real houses. So it says, for many Americans, Yiddish equals a kind of sentimental sepia-toned yesteryear in much the same way that Woody's radical politics have been excised from the cultural space that this land has come to occupy. He says, what captured me was the way the video recaptured the Yiddish worker radical politics that roots it in the here and now. I'm, I'm really interested in the question too, because I think you're all very much involved in a Yiddish cultural space that is not about yesteryear, but is very much about now. So I wonder about everybody's thoughts on that comment. Who, Rachel start, yes. Great. Well, I want to bring in another song, which listening to this made me think about a certain moment and how a translation from English into Yiddish really captured the feeling and it gave such an incredible catharsis. And this was very soon after 9-11 and um, the Klezmatics played at a little club which no longer exists called Tonic and you guys, I think it was the debut of your translation of Holly Near's I Ain't Afraid. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, um, it was, well, it was me and Adrian um, and um, yeah, and actually it wasn't, it wasn't the translation that we ended up um, using uh, which was co-written by Michael Wex and Adrian, um, and um, but but we we put something together at that point that was based on "I Ain't Afraid." And the thing is that the song had been like floating around, but I it was sort of off of my radar. And I went back and listened to it. I said, "Oh wow, like the song didn't work for me, you know, when when it was written, but it works for me now." <laughs> so. Um, so you know that's that's what happened. Um, yeah, uh, that's a that's a, a great example of of a song, and you know, I, you know, a lot of you know the the contem the contemporary songs, you know that that Klezmatics have done. Um, I you know I really thought that they needed to be uh, translated into Yiddish because that's what we perform for our audience and. You know, and the, as with this land is your land in Yiddish, it's like, you know, more people will be singing it now. And, you know, you can't argue with with that as, you know, a sort of, uh, you know, a, a concept that that one of the reasons that you translate songs is so that people who wouldn't otherwise sing these songs with wonderful, you know, ideas and thoughts and, you know, purpose be, you know, sung by other communities. And, you know, that's that's why I like doing it. 
I, I think it also spoke though to the, the question, which was like, you know, taking a Yiddish translation and making it feel very, very relevant and contemporary. Mm -hmm. and like all about yesteryear. Like this was a song about saying you're, you know, we're looking at communities that are different and we're saying, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of your clerics. I'm not afraid of your shul. Um, yeah. And it's done. And when it's, I mean, Vex, do you want to talk about this? Like, uh, I can. I mean, one thing, if you think about Yiddish is, yes, you know, having being only, you know, from the thrilling days of the yesteryear. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. When I when I was stuck in the bathroom at home and we ran out of toilet paper, it wasn't so much a matter of yesteryear. It was a matter of now, you know, uh, if you actually use the language that Numenon that has been assigned to it, that sepia toned, whatever, the little zeta, the little bubba zeta of languages uh, goes away very quickly. Uh, because again, you know, I was once asked, what was the most common Yiddish expression heard in your home? And there was four of us in one washroom. It was Mr. Angefallen, you know, did you fall in? Because uh, somebody else needed to get there. So you, you get an earthier approach uh, to the whole thing uh, as far as that goes. But, and I think that it, uh, that actually does tie into what Ruchel was saying in that you see it, whether you use it every day in every aspect of your life is one question, but whether you are able to see it as applicable to every aspect of your life uh, and use it when that aspect demands, uh, I don't think it's a, it's a real problem. I mean, uh, whether it's, it's song translation or, or anything else, the stuff is there. If you, you know, it's like Herzl said about something very different. If you <laughs> want it, it'll be there. But you also, you have to put a bit of time into it too. Uh, so I, I don't think that that's, you know, I think that's in part what we're trying to work against yeah. all of this is that, no, this isn't Ellis Island, uh, which I, this is just a museum now, isn't it? Uh, they, they don't really use it anymore. You know, this we're Yiddish is not Ellis Island. Yiddish is border walls or Yiddish is, you know, just the guys that check your baggage in an airport are just as relevant to that as all the lovely sepia tone stories about mass immigration in the 1890s. Well, and I, it doesn't, it's, it seems to me, again, casual new understander of this phenomenon, it may have been that the people who were working with Yiddish a generation or two ago were really connected to Yiddish through the generation or two before them that was about yesteryear, but it seems to me, I mean, <laughs> There's all these, we know there are so many young people flocking to everything Yiddish, um, some on this call. Um, is it your sense that that has anything to do with yesteryear or not? Is, I mean, are those people connecting back to their great grandparents or are they just like really into this for some totally other reason? I, I would say both, but you know, you gotta remember there were, after 1924, the idea of a young person speaking Yiddish like they just got off the boat because they just got off the boat became increasingly rare. Right. It became an old people's language because of the, uh, the Immigration Act of 1924. Right. People coming after the war where you had a substantial population of native Yiddish speakers coming to the US who were young were also uh, rather traumatized. They probably had felt better at some point in their lives. And not passing the stuff on was in part a way of saying, we're never going back there. You know, Yiddish became a part of the life that we have left behind to a large degree. And people didn't think it was important to teach their kids, you know, especially after the establishment of the state of Israel, uh, everybody started going to Hebrew day schools where I grew up in Alberta and Canada. Uh, in Calgary and Edmonton, when I was a kid, there were full-time day schools in both Hebrew and Yiddish. Uh, I don't think those Yiddish schools are there anymore, but I know the Hebrew schools are. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you got away. And then you get, you know, the third or fourth generation 
for whom it's almost, it's like the third son in the Passover Seder, uh, is what is this? Uh, and you tell them. Yeah. Uh, so we are just about out of time, I'm sorry to say, and I wanna thank the audience for such smart, wonderful questions and chats. It's been great to have all of you on. I am gonna ask Lauren to play us out with the video one more time. And obviously if you if you need to leave, you can, but I think we all wanna okay. look at the song, at, hear, this, hear it again, um, having heard all this. I'd love for both Lauren and, I mean, everyone, if you wanna take very quickly, but certainly Lauren and Daniel, before we watch the video again, and hear the song again for maybe you to say a, a final word of what we should be looking for, thinking about, or what anything else you want to add as we as we go to look at it again. Well, I I just want to thank everybody for uh, you know be being such a luminous company. It's a real honor to sit here with you all, and I I miss you all so much. Um, I all I would say this is a song, or at least in our version, I think it's a lot about borders. Um, and it's about the, the, the borders between lands and the borders between people, the borders between classes and cultures. And if we're talking about translation, that's another kind of border crossing. And in many ways, you know, the thing that I love about the international chevra or community of, of Yiddish artists and Yiddishists, people who are focusing on this language and culture, um, and using it in many different ways it is uh, the intergenerationality of it um, and the the fluidity with which borders are crossed and challenged and undermined. And one of those borders is the is the the imaginary border between the so-called past and now. Um, I think that the more we engage with material that may be hundreds of years old or a hundred years old, the more we realize that the world that those people inhabited was in many important ways not so different than the world that we inhabit and the challenges that they faced are not so different from the challenges that we face. So for me, engaging with the past is not a, a way of not engaging with the, the present or the future. It's a way of finding a way to, to make a future. And so that's what I would say. I love that. Not nostalgic, Anyone else but, have a last word before we play the video again? <laughs> 